Good morning, friends. Welcome, welcome to church. Welcome to service. Thanks so much, friends online. Thanks for tuning in. Friends, it's a beautiful day the Lord has blessed us with. Amen? All right, so we're not going to waste any time. We're going to ask for those who are able, please stand. We're going we're gonna to lift some praises here. We're going to pray first, and then we'll sing. So, Heavenly Father, Jesus, we are just so thankful, Lord. We're grateful, Lord, for the sunshine outside, Lord, and for the breath in our lungs, Lord, for the little ways in which you just always continue to bless us and pour out your favor on us, Lord. So we just thank you for that. We pray for this morning, Father. We pray blessings, blessings over this service, Lord. Just bless our time, and we're just going to give you all the honor and glory because you deserve it, Father. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen.
Good morning, Harvest Chapel. You can go ahead and be seated this morning. Welcome. It is so good. Oh, I think I'm standing too close to you, Joel. It is so good to be here worshiping together with you on this beautiful Sunday morning. Thank you for coming and joining us. My name is Pastor Lisa, if we've not had an opportunity to meet. So a few announcements for you this morning. Um, first off, we just want to welcome those of you who are joining us online this morning. Thank you for plugging in and um, joining us in worship. And for all of us, whether you're joining us online or if you're here in the building with us, we invite you to let us know that you are here with us, worshiping with us this morning by filling out our connection card. You can find the connection card in the pocket in the chair in front of you, or you can go to our digital connection card through our Harvest Chapel website. Now, this connection card really serves the purpose of us staying connected one to another. It's a way that you can communicate to us how we might be able to serve you or pray for you. It's our prayer request card. And also, when there are things that are going on in the life of the church, it's a way for you to let us know that you would like to participate or let us know about the next steps that you would like to take. So if you could fill that out, we would appreciate that. We also would like you to know that um, we have some give boxes in the back of the sanctuary. If you have come prepared to um, worship through giving this morning, you can drop your tithes and offering in those give boxes on your way out, and you can also continue to make a difference and give to Harvest Chapel through our website. So Harvest Chapel, um, one of the values, um, part of the culture of Harvest Chapel is that we are a church that is compassionately generous, and that means that what comes in, we give out. We're not a pool, but we are a river. And so we serve our local community and we serve um, our missionaries and support missionaries around the world. So thank you for the ways that you continue to give. If you are a guest with us this morning, we want to extend a special welcome to you. And for our guests, if you hang on to that connection card that you fill out, and right after service, if you go through the double doors straight ahead to our welcome center, you can turn that connection card in. We would love the opportunity to meet you, to be able to put a name and a face together, and we do have a small gift for you to thank you for coming and spending um, some time with us this morning in worship. And then, um, as you see, it's a, an exciting morning this morning because it is Baptism Sunday, so it's a great morning for you to be joining us. And at the end of service, in celebration of baptism, we have some blue raspberry snow cones. Now, how long has it been since you've had a blue raspberry snow cone? So we've got some people that are ready to serve there, so we hope that you will come and enjoy one of those in honor of our celebration this morning. And lastly, we want to let you know that we have some community groups that are starting up. Community groups are a way to get plugged in, to grow together with other people as we move arm in arm towards Jesus, a great way to get connected. And so on our Welcome Center, you can find some flyer handouts that describe for you what the community groups are that are coming up, and then you can let us know through your connection card or you can go to our website and let us know that you'd like to be a part of a community group they are getting started this week and so let's say a word of prayer and then after that we will stand up and continue to worship in song Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that we get to gather together amongst family and friends and to come and worship your name. We thank you for your goodness towards us. We thank you for the beauty of this day. We thank you for the freedom that you have given us to come and to worship you. Lord, move amongst us this morning and may our worship be honoring of you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, friends, let's rise as we continue in worship. You are my life, you are my love, you are my reason. You are my hope, you are my joy, you are my passion, my all in all. Jesus, my all in all, my all in all. Jesus, my all in all. You are my reason You are my 
all sing hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah, what a Savior. My hope, my everything. And you are my life, you are my love, you are my reason. You are my hope, you are my joy, you are my passion, my
All right, so friends, at this time, we're going to come into a time of prayer. So if you want to be seated, you can be seated. For those of you who maybe have a need or a desire or the Lord is just stirring within you this morning, we want to let you know these steps right up here, they're open. If you want to come forward, if you want to kneel, if you just want to make this a place where you meet the Lord this morning, you're welcome to do that. So we're going to play this chorus one more time while you come. Perfect love is alive in me, refining and setting free. Awaken my soul, transform and make whole. Lord, sanctify me. Let's pray. Lord, you are the king of glory. You are the creator of all. You are armed with strength and clothed in majesty. Your wisdom is beyond measure. All of your ways are perfect and your word is flawless. Lord, we stand amazed that you count us worthy, that you pursue us with your love. Honestly, Lord, sometimes it's hard for us to love ourselves, yet you are ever pursuing. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that you hold all things together. And Lord, we think of your word and what your word says about in the beginning how you created everything and you brought order out of chaos and everything was perfect. You and the people that you created were in perfect relationship and the people that you created were in perfect relationship with each other and humanity was in perfect relationship with your creation. And Lord, by one choice, one act of disobedience. Everything was fractured. That, Lord, our relationship with you was fractured. And our relationship with one another was fractured. And our relationship with your creation was fractured. But, Lord, in your perfect way, you saw fit to not abandon us to ourselves in this broken condition. But you sent your son. And your word says that you were pleased to have the fullness of deity dwell in Jesus. And that through Jesus, you reconciled all things to yourself, things in heaven and things on earth. Through his blood that was shed on the cross, to bring peace, to bring reconciliation. And so this morning, Lord, we pray for peace and reconciliation. Lord, we know the news. We have watched the tragedy as to what happened in Buffalo yesterday. And Lord, our hearts are broken. Lord, we pray for the families of those who have been lost. Father, we ask that you would comfort them in their grief. Father, we pray for the first responders. Lord, have mercy. Lord, we pray for the young man who is accused. Lord, have mercy. And Father, you are a God of justice. Father, we pray for justice. Father, we pray for reconciliation. We pray for unity. Father, we pray that you would help us because we can't do this on our own. But with your strength in us, the mystery of the gospel, Christ in us, you can help us to do what we can't do on our own. Father, forgive us for the ways that we allow difference to divide. 
Forgive us for the hate. Lord, be merciful. We ask that your justice would sweep across this nation and around your world, that it would be a safe place for all. For your word tells us that all people, all people have been created in your image. And Lord, you died for all people. And so this morning we lift up to you, Lord, our friends, the ones that we love, the ones that we don't know, our ebony friends in the community that is suffering. Father, we pray for the knowledge and understanding of your love. We pray for hope and the movement of your hand in justice. Lord, it should not be that people go grocery shopping and don't come home. It should not be that people go to work at a grocery store and don't come home. Lord, we cry out to you for a world where children can play outside, where all are treated with love and kindness, Lord, beyond equality, love and kindness made in your image. Heal us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Renew us, Lord. Come and make us people of peace and reconciliation, Lord, that we would bring light where there is darkness, that we would bring hope where there is despair, that we would bring order where there is chaos, that we would bring peace to the midst of strife, that we would bring your love wherever it is that you call us to go. Make us people that go where you want us to go. Say what you want us to say. Do what you want us to do. That you would be glorified for your glory, for our good, and for others' gain. And Lord, for the burdens that we carry in our heart this morning, for bodies and minds that fail, as we strive for and pray for loved ones who are struggling in their bodies and minds, for relationships that need reconciliation, for places that need your peace, for finances, for all the things that we worry about, God. You are provider, you are creator, you are comforter, and you are more than enough. Be more than enough to us. And may we shine your light wherever we go, that more would come to know you. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Jesus, that you came for peace and reconciliation. May it be so. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Perfect love is alive in me, refining and setting free. Awaken my soul, transform and make whole. Lord, sanctify me. Awaken my soul, transform and make whole. Lord, sanctify me. everyone. Um, today is an exciting day. Obviously, we have the baptismal tank here. We have been celebrating new life in Christ. And, and at the same time, I almost pressed reset on everything in the service after last night because here we were in this space at 6 p.m. gathered in prayer with some church leaders from South County, 
over this very issue of racial reconciliation and the church being united, and then to go home to the news of what happened in Buffalo, um, I mean, just words cannot begin to express how devastating. And the opportunity that we have as a church to to model and demonstrate the goodness of God's creation and diversity and, and, and how all men created equal, that's a good start, but that's not enough because we believe that all people have been created in the image of God and it is in that diversity of differences that we fully reflect the image of God because no one nation, tribe, or tongue can fully reflect the image of our creative God. And so our hearts break for that. And even in the, the scriptures that I'm about to talk about in a few minutes in the, in the message, at, at the end of what I'm going to read today, Paul talks about there's no longer Jew nor Gentile, no longer barbarian or Scythian, which were older tribal definitions, but Christ is all and is in all. That's the goal. But then at the same time, I remembered we're also celebrating life today, and so this is how life works, yes? Often we hold things in tension. We recognize the brokenness and pain in the world, while at the same time we trust in the sustaining grace of God that's bringing new life, that's bringing hope and healing out of awful circumstances, and he is pleased to work in and amongst his people to do that. So please do continue to pray with us. We're going to have more events like last night. I know not everybody was able to gather with us as we prayed around these issues and how the church can point toward the goodness of God and Jesus in unity. Um, so we'll probably have some more opportunities in the future you can keep your ear to the ground for. But today we're going to continue with our celebration of new life in the face of that to say God is at work and on the move. And as a part of that, you came to a great service today. Good choice. Because today we get to celebrate baptism uh, not only with uh, a young man who has taken on the faith for himself and making a public declaration of that faith, that's going to come a little bit later, but today on the, the other end we get to celebrate with a family who welcomed new life as we baptize their little infant girl, Reverie. So I'm going to invite uh, the Anderson family to come forward, Brad and Heather, and uh, we'll see, I think I see Frankie still there. He made it. This is always the fun part of doing these in the middle of the service. Will the young children make it to this point? We don't make them sit through Pastor Jim's sermon. That would be uh, cruel and inhumane. <laughs> You're supposed to say, no, 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 it's not. No, that's a... <laughs> but we are excited today to celebrate this gift of new life. And yeah, if you guys want to come right up on the platform here. We'll let everybody get a good look. <laughs> there we go. And I'll stand here just to guard the way. I know this looks a little bit like a uh, diving board, but... But Brad and Heather have chosen to share this gift of new life with us as a church, and we are pleased to celebrate the baptism of reverie today. Dear friends in Christ... God, through Moses, made covenant with his people, saying, These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your children. Impress them upon them. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. And in the days of the new covenant, Christ Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And on the day of Pentecost... The Apostle Peter declared regarding the salvation given through Christ that the promise is to you and to your children. So it is therefore our privilege to present our children to the Lord and our duty to raise them in his ways. Brad and Heather now come to bring reverie, to offer her in dedication and pledge in the presence of this congregation to bring her up in the Lord's discipline and instruction. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you've made saving covenant with your people, and out of your loving kindness, you've decided that we should live before you in families. We thank you for the privilege that it is to dedicate our children to you in the steadfast hope that one day they will learn and understand your covenant and live for your glory. 
We ask now for this child that she might be delivered from the power of sin and Satan and be set apart from you by the power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray for these parents as well, that you might give them divine aid so that both by instruction and example they might lead her in the way of everlasting life so that all will come together in unity in your kingdom. And we ask for us as their church family that we might faithfully discharge our duties both to parents and child. And it's through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. And just a few questions for you. Do you in the presence of God in this church solemnly dedicate this child to the Lord? Do you, so far as you're able on her behalf, renounce the devil and his works, the lure of the world, and the sinful desires of fallen humanity, so that in the training of her you will not be led by them, and so far as you are able, you will keep her from following them? That's the longest one. Will you faithfully strive by word and example to lead reverie to personal faith in Christ? Do you accept the authority of the Bible, the Old and New Testaments? And then out of them will you diligently teach reverie the commands and promises of Most High God, raising her in the discipline and instruction of the Lord? Amen. Well, now I look to you, and I love saying this every time, that while the Lord has given a primary responsibility to parents to raise reverie and to know Jesus, as a church family, we have a part to play in this. And some of you have already been the nursery workers who have been able to lovingly care for Revy while her parents have been in service. Others of you may be her Sunday school teachers or youth leaders along the way. Or some of you may just be Mr. So-and-so who sits fourth row up, third seat in every Sunday, and whether or not you have a smile on your face will tell her something about the love of God and being a part of the family of Christ. And so if you're willing to accept this responsibility, I'm going to ask you to stand with in an act of solidarity, recognizing we have guests with us today. It's okay to stand just as a, an act of solidarity with family and friends today. Okay. Revy, are you ready, sweetheart? Oh. Look at all these folks here. Yeah, there we go. Would you name this child? Reverie Lee Anderson. Reverie Lee Anderson. Reverie Lee Anderson, I am pleased to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh. <laughs> we'll do this. Uh, let's pray for Reverie. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you for these waters of baptism, and we just pray now for this life before us, the potential that we sense, the gift that she is. Lord, we do pray for your spirit to be at work in her already, that she might early know the depth of your love and who she is in you, created and saved in the name of Jesus. And we pray your blessing on this whole family. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Well, would you celebrate with them one more time, and you can be seated then. Thank you. So the water is slightly warmer than Lake Erie at this moment. Uh, <laughs> well, as we think about what baptism signifies. And we're in the middle of this message series, The Domino Effect, and it occurred to me that there is a wonderful coming together of these two things. But it does require us to go back to maybe what I was talking about a little bit before and to stop and to think about death for a little bit. And I know that no one likes to think about death. None of us enjoy contemplating our own mortality. But it can be a powerful thing to sit for a moment and to think about it. In fact, when I was just a young man in college, my freshman year, one of my professors assigned a book for us to read. It's a pretty well-known book written by Stephen Covey. He wrote The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Anybody else here ever read Seven Habits of Highly? Yeah, yeah, I see some hands, yeah. And, and while I couldn't tell you many of them, one of the habits did stick with me and was particularly profound for a 19-year-old, and it was the second habit. 
begin with the end in mind. And to help us understand what it meant to begin with the end in mind, Covey invited us to a little mental exercise. He said, imagine a funeral. So if you want to do that right now, we'll just, we'll just do this together. Just stop and think about a funeral. Imagine that you're in a church, a sanctuary, perhaps like this. The casket is at the front. It's flanked with the beautiful bouquets of flowers. There's soft music playing in the background. Perhaps a favorite hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. That's classic, Amazing Grace. People begin to gather dressed somberly and you see some tears dotting some cheeks. And as the service begins, the pastor or priest walks to the platform, offers some scriptures and an opening prayer. And then someone walks to the microphone, Kleenex in hand, just in case, as they begin to eulogize the deceased. Are you with me? You tracking? Okay, we're, we're in this together. Now I want you to imagine that in that casket is you. Right, I, I know, that's a little surprising, but, but we want to stop and consider what would it be like to attend our own funeral? That person who walks to the front to speak, what would they say about you and your life and your legacy? How would they describe who you are what would it be like? And, and so Covey invited in that second chapter, as a 19-year-old, I'm reading, and he's inviting us to attend our own funeral. And, and to be quite honest, at 19 years old, I had barely thought about death in general, certainly not my own death. But it's a profound exercise when you stop and think about it. And while that business book may not have been written from a perspective of faith, I don't know if he knew it, but Stephen Covey was actually living into one of, that, that idea of thinking with the end in mind and living from a posture of what will it be like to die, that's actually Jesus' message. Jesus was the one who invited us to lay down our lives so that we might find it, to die so that we might truly live, even if we don't like to think about it. And so that's where we need to set our minds as we move on to the next domino in our series, the domino effect. So just a super quick 30-second recap. We were in this series starting Easter Sunday, working through a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to an ancient Roman church of Colossae. He believed firmly that the resurrection of Jesus was the start of something fresh and new, and he invited his readers to live into that new start. It was as if the resurrection was like the first domino to topple in knocking over a chain reaction of dominoes. But the dominoes grow in size and scope and in magnitude exponentially. And that's how it works in the kingdom of God is as one thing falls into another, and this treasure trove of proverbial dominoes in Colossians has growing impact in our lives. So, okay, maybe longer than 30 seconds because I'm going to need another 20 to go over the last four dominoes, right? So we've stacked up four dominoes in a row. First was Jesus is king. Week two is Jesus holds it all together. Week three was Jesus in you. Week four last Sunday was Jesus in us. But this is where I need to offer a little bit of the I need to go newspaper route and offer a bit of a correction and an amendment to what I said last Sunday. So we talked about how God deals with us personally, Jesus and you, but God also brings about his purposes in us corporately, Jesus in us. Or I made a joke that we could take a page from the playbook of our southern friends, Jesus in y'all, right? Remember that? Well, after service, I was gently corrected by two different people, independent sources, fact-checked, verified, because I've never lived in the South, but they have, that apparently in the South, y'all can still be singular, referring to one person. If you want to be clear that you're talking about a group of people, in the South, it's all y'all. <laughs> now you know. Who knew? I wouldn't have guessed. I don't know why you need it twice but you double down on it, all y'all. So there you go. But the truth still holds that God is at work in all y'all, us. 
Now, what does that look like as the dominoes continue to topple? And today we think about that life of God in all y'all in Colossians chapter 3. If you want to follow along, we'll be uh, in the first 11 verses or the words will be on the screen behind you. Here the Apostle Paul writes, beginning in verse 1. Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all these things, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Now, there is so much that could be said about these words of Paul, and I would encourage you to consider them this week, but I want to zoom in on verse 3 because it struck me as we're setting up these dominoes of faith to tip in our lives. I think the next domino is found in verses 3 and 4. But starting with verse 3, Paul writes, For you, y'all, have died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So this is, of course, why I invited you to think about your own funeral at the start, because here, that's what Paul does for the Colossians. He uses this metaphor. He's not talking about a literal death. He's not writing to dead people here. There's still very much heart racing, pulse beating, lungs breathing. But he says, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. This is his way, he constantly comes back to this in his letters, Paul does, of saying that when we have faith in Christ, there is a next chapter, there's a turning point, there's an old way of life that's gone and there is a new creation that has come. There are former ways that are behind and there is a future that we look ahead to. The old is gone, the new is here from death to life, for you died to the old way and you're on the new way. And he goes on to say, your life is now hidden with Christ in God. And, and, and I wondered, what does that mean that your life is hidden? But then he explained it in the very next verse, verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, and we can just pause right there. I know he goes on, but this is what Paul means, that our life is hidden with Christ in God, that Jesus now becomes our life. When we recognize the work of God in me and in us, then we begin to take on the life of Jesus, and Jesus becomes our life. Or the short version of the domino is, Jesus is your life. But for this life to happen requires the death of the old. This is why Paul continues to go on in verse 3 about, for you died. And it's not an original message to him. I mean, Jesus himself shared as he described what life as a follower of him would look like. Jesus summed it up pretty tidily as death. In Luke chapter 9, when he was talking to a large group of his disciples, he said in chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Take up your cross daily and follow me. If Christ is our life, when we find ourselves recognizing the work of God within us and seeking to pursue Jesus, it is a constant daily choice 
to deny ourselves of what we used to do and to live into the new life that Christ has for us, to put to death the old ways, to embrace the new. But I recognize that we don't enjoy thinking about death We don't like to use this terminology because it's close to home. But my daughters a few years ago helped me kind of wrestle through and understand this, even though they didn't know they were doing it, of course. But um, this was a couple of years ago. We were in Rochester for the day, and as we were driving back home, we decided to stop in Spencerport, New York. And Spencerport holds a near and dear place in our heart because right out of college, when we were first married, that was where my wife and I lived in a an apartment in the village. And when we were both in grad school, we lived in Spencerport, and our first daughter was born while we were living in Spencerport. So we took some time to kind of take a walk down memory lane that day, and we, we drove to the places we used to drive, and we walked along the Erie Canal where we used to walk, and we ate at the pizza shop that we used to eat at. And all the while, we were filling in the girls on a little bit of the story of their mom and dad, as if it was some kind of Nicholas Sparks movie. And, uh, but only my wife and I have memories of Spencerport because our oldest was just six months old when we moved. And so I could tell that our youngest daughter who was four at the time of us making this revisiting trip, she was trying to piece it all together and figure out how does Spencerport fit in my history when she wasn't there? Because every time she'd say, where was I? And well, you weren't there, sweetheart. And finally, before we left town, we drove past the old apartment and she said, did I live there? And we said, no, sweetheart. Miriam was the only one who lived there. And it was a very short while, and she said, well, where was I when Miriam lived there? You know, as a four-year-old, trying to piece this together, this is hard, deep stuff. And Miriam tried to help out. She said, well, you weren't alive yet. And the look of shock on my four-year-old's face when she, with big eyes, said, wait, you mean I was dead? In that moment, it was all I could do to keep from laughing. But also, I I didn't, is that what it is? Before you're born, are you dead? When you're not yet alive, are you? A four-year-old trying to wrestle with this being alive versus dead, and what do we mean by these words? I recognize that as I stand here today and I offer you Paul's words, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ. For some of us, it's, wait, I died? What? I'm still very much alive and breathing. But here Paul is inviting us to live into that spiritual death, or we could perhaps put it this way, that the secret of life is to learn to die before we die. That the secret of life is to die before we die physically to learn how it is that we can put off the old and the past so that we can find our life hidden with Christ. To pursue the new thing and new life that Jesus has for us requires the death of the old. And and this is where if we had more time, we'd go over this big long list of rules. I think most people expect to hear a sermon preached about verses five and following because it's all of those don't do this, don't do that sort of stuff that our culture assumes is the message of Jesus. And there are some don't do this, but we need to first understand that this is not just a list of behavioral modification, this is not sin management, this list is what it looks like to live as if our life is hidden with Christ. This is what it looks like to die to our past and those desires and to pursue the new life in Christ. So if Jesus is our life, then sure, there's no room for sexual immorality or impurity or lust or evil desires or any of that because Jesus has something better and new for us. But sometimes it takes a while to die to those old things because the old ways keep popping up. They're like weeds in a flower bed. And the only way to really deal with weeds, you you can't continue to feed them. You can't put fertilizer in that soil or they're going to keep growing. 
You can't continue to nurture them. You can't ignore the weeds. They're not going to go away on their own. You need to spray those things with whatever toxic chemicals you want to. Okay, vinegar, you, you know, all you hippies and your, no, I'm, I'm just, you know, the non-toxic stuff. But the stuff that'll kill down to the root and then you need to take that root and you need to pull it out never to come back again. And so it is that when we find our life in Christ, there are going to be some old ways of the earthly nature that we're going to have to put to death. And it's a process. But there is a moment in our lives when we recognize Jesus is your life and that the secret of life is to die before we die. And the author of the devotional that we've been using along with this series, the Daily Devotional, J.D. Walt, some of you have become familiar with his writings, he reminds us that the church actually has a ritual in which we enact this death. He puts it this way, the technical term for this phenomenon is baptism. Baptism. You, you wondered when we were getting back to the whole baptism thing, didn't you? But when Christ writes, for you died, he is referring to the waters of baptism. That in baptism, th there are many biblical images for death, but one of the more profound ones is drowning. Not only here, but earlier in this letter, Paul made it clear in Colossians 2.12, he says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Baptism is a rich and profound symbol. It is a symbol of burial, of the old way being gone and new life as we come out of the water raised with Christ. So often we think of burial and we think of shovel and soil, but the waters of baptism, it's a way of drowning the old to make room for the new. Paul loved this image so much he used it in Romans 6. When writing to a different group, he said, don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. I know none of us like thinking about death. We don't like to consider our own mortality. But Jesus invites us to die before we die. And there is no better image, a stark image, yes, but no better way to describe what the journey of life and following Jesus. It's a constant picking up of that cross, of denying ourselves those former things so that we can make room for the new life of Christ to grow within us so that Jesus can be your life. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Jesus is your life. The secret of life is to die before we die. And the waters of baptism remind us of this profound truth. So how about you? Have you made Christ your life today? Through faith, do you know that his death on the cross and his resurrection made way for you to finally get past those sins that rack you with guilt, that hold you down and weigh you down? Maybe you're here today and, and you haven't made that choice yet. We would encourage you to step across that line of faith, to trust that there is forgiveness and new life in Christ. And if that's where God is moving and leading you, we'd love to know if you could let us know on your connection card, if you're watching online, if you could drop us a note. Then I also recognize that for some of us today, maybe you're here like me, and, and today is a day where you remember your baptism. Maybe you were old enough that you remember your baptism itself. Maybe you were baptized as a child and you can thank God for the gift of parents who set you on a path of faith, and you're here today. The thing about remembering our baptism is remembering that baptism is really just the start. It's a starting line, and there's a whole life after it. We're not done. When I was baptized as a 14-year-old in cold Lake Ontario with winds and waves going, and I gave a testimony that was so moving and beautiful and profound, but nobody could hear it because of the noise of the wind and the waves, so you don't know otherwise. But 
But something changed that day, but it doesn't mean that I was done in my journey of faith. I hadn't arrived. It wasn't a finish line. It was the starting point. And there are still things in my life that need to die, the old that needs to be put off so that I can put on the new of Christ. And maybe that's for you today. So at the, as the service winds down, once we're done with baptisms, perhaps you want to come forward and as a sign of commitment, you could remember your baptism by even touching your hand to the water and reminding yourself of that new life in Christ, inspiring you to die once again so that Christ can be your life. But wherever you're at today, my prayer is that you would know Christ is your life, that it is hidden with God in him, May you choose to take up your cross and follow him. May you die to yourself so that you might find life that is truly life. Amen. We're going to spend some time in prayer at the end of service, but at this point, I'm going to invite my friend Ben Morrow to join me on the platform as we get to celebrate this new life of Christ with Ben. And so here on the other end of the spectrum, much as we had the joy of celebrating the baptism of reverie, now we get to celebrate with Ben and his family as he publicly gives witness to his faith. And so similarly, I'm going to use some of the words that have been used for literally centuries for folks who have committed their life to Christ and gone through the waters of baptism. So dear friends in Christ, our faith declares that by the sin of Adam, the offspring of Adam are corrupted in their very nature, and from birth we are inclined to sin, and that new life and right relationship with God are only possible through the redemptive acts of God in Christ Jesus. Believing this to be true and in obedience to the command of Jesus, Ben has now come to make public confession that his sins have been washed away, and through means of baptism with water, to give sign of that inward washing and new life in Christ that is now his by faith. So we ask you to pray that through this means of grace, he might be strengthened and encouraged to keep covenant with God so that he might experience the constant renewal of life within him through the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Almighty and everlasting God, your covenant is firm and your promises can be trusted. We ask you today on behalf of Ben that as he comes to this baptism might give clear witness that he has received the washing of sin through faith in the cleansing blood of Jesus, your son. May he ever rejoice in the forgiveness of sins, the indwelling of your spirit, and the fellowship of the church and the assurance of resurrection to glory in the world to come. Amen. Well, Ben. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and do you desire to be baptized in his name? Do you intend to, by this act to testify to all the world that you are a Christian and a loyal follower of Christ? Do you believe in the Holy Scriptures, the Bible, of the Old and New Testaments? Trusting God to help you, will you resist temptation and keep from doing those things you know to be sinful or displeasing to God? And will you attend church services and do those things you know a Christian should do? Yes. Then we are pleased to celebrate your baptism. And Ben has prepared, this is impressive, not everybody's ready to speak in front of a large group, but he wants to share a testimony of his faith with you now. They're all friends, they don't bite. Okay. Here, you can come right up, right up here, right up here. Hi, um, my name is Ben Morrow and I was born overseas. I've been going to church for my whole life, but it's only been recently when I realized that the Lord has really always been with me, and I really do believe in him, and I'm ready to do something that signifies that belief, and I'm ready to die before I die. <laughs> so I want to thank my family for coming, and Josh, and yeah. That just made my day. Um, there are no brownie points in heaven for listening to the pastor's sermon, and 
dropping it as a reference, but that is awesome. Uh, well, Ben, I'm going to get our mic set up, and if you want to join me in the baptismal. slightly warmer than Lake Ontario. <laughs> Let's pray for Ben. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness and for the way that you constantly walk with us even before we know it. And we thank you for your work in Ben's life, his recognition of that, and his commitment to you. Lord, may you honor that, and may he remember these waters of baptism as he chooses to surrender his life to your plans and your purposes. May you bless him and lead him and fill him with your spirit. Ready? And now we are pleased to baptize Ben in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. had the privilege of celebrating baptism with several folks today. A reminder that we have celebratory blue raspberry snow cones. I don't know what a blue raspberry is, but it fits the theme of the day. Blue water, new life. And if this has stirred something within you and you'd like to be baptized, we, we do baptism services here every so often as a church. Let us know. But until we see you again next week, friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you. May he give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>